Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Christian. I'm a postdoc in, um, in Jülich at the INM1 in Katzins Institute in a group of, uh, of Timo Dickscheid. And as, as some of you might know, my work mainly re resolves around developing deep learning algorithms to automatically identify uh, cytoarchitectonic brain areas um, from images. And usually in this kind of talks, I present the newest methods with some improved results. This time it will be a little bit different because this time we did a little bit of, um, uh, of exploration into the future and tried to answer the question, um, what, uh, what benefit these nice um, high resolution 3D reconstructions that Jan Oliver presented yesterday um, will benefit um, site architectonic mapping. So they are not yet fully available, but they are in the progress and soon we will have them. So um, we will, uh, it's, it's a good idea to have a look at what challenges we can, can expect and so on. So as a note, this, uh, this work was um, similar to what Eric presented yesterday, done in a collaboration with, uh, with the MNI. So uh, another um, example for a nice highball collaboration. Yeah, so um, uh, as I said, the main, the, main, um, the main idea of this project was to see how we can make use of these uh, one micron uh, reconstructions, so one micron isotropic resolutions. Why is, this, why is this helpful? So one immediate benefit that we could expect is that it removes any dependence on um, what I call here cutting artifacts. So when you just cut a brain, you can't always maintain the perfect cutting angle that you would need for cytoarchitecture identification. Having 3D completely uh, circumvents this, uh, this problem. And also it allows us to, um, to include 3D context in the um, in the classification, um, so in the, in this project, as I said, is more exploratory. So we want to have a look what challenges we can expect, and of course, there are challenges. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this this uh, this talk today. So, what data did I use for this? So you have seen this before. So this is these are the two publicly available uh, one micron um, volumes of interest, which are available in the um, in the eBrain's knowledge graph. So two volumes one of them from the primary visual cortex, one of them from the secondary visual cortex. So this is what, what I used for, for this project. Our experimental design was that we take um, a deep neural network that, that I developed during my, um, during my PhD um, that is able to classify cytoarchitectonic areas uh, in the big brain. We then take these 3D volumes that we saw before, extract 2D cross sections from the volume and apply the model to these cross sections and later inspect how the prediction um, behaves depending on how we how we slice the volume. So one valid question here is why do we uh, apply um, actually 2D convolutional network to 3D data? So we have 3D data, why not use it? Um, can you maybe quickly press the downward button? Arrow down. Yeah, thank you. Um, because, uh, yeah, so there, there are two reasons why we didn't use the 3D data directly in our neural networks. The first one is quite, quite obvious. We only have two volumes, which is not enough to train deep neural network. Um, but this will be circumvented as soon as we have, um, for, for example, the full big brain uh, reconstructed. The second one is um, more severe, which is that um, training 3D networks is very expensive. We usually need very large um, image patches in 2D to, uh, to, uh, to do the classification. So about 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. If we would take this to 3D, so 2,000 by 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, we would end up with um, with a single sample of eight gigabyte, just the input, and then the total memory footprint of the model would be about 2.5 terabyte, which is a little bit too much for uh, for usual use cases. So for this project, we stick with uh, with 2D um, for the moment. So. Um, what, what did we do to the data? So in the first step, so we downloaded the data, the, the, these data volumes from eBrains. We then repaired artifacts, which means that these, maybe you saw these black stripes in the videos before. So we just uh, um, removed these by linear interpolation. And then we created, um, uh, we extracted different 2D planes from the volumes, which you see here on the right. So we parameter, parameterized these, these red planes that you see, and then extracted a large number of different cross sections, and then to each of these cross sections, we um, we applied our neural network and saw and looked at what it uh, what it predicts. As a side project, a side product of this project, I developed a small Python library that enables the parallel extraction of these um, 
of these cross sections because each of the volume is about 200 gigabytes and extracting um, 2D cross sections from them is not necessarily the easiest thing. So um, in case anybody else has the, has the pleasure to do this, just read out, reach out to me. Uh, okay, so what does what do the prediction results look like if we apply uh, if we apply the neural network to these cross sections? So to explain the plots here, so we see here in each of the plots we see a different um, different one of these parameters that we that we saw before. So a parameterization of these of these planes here, and then we have two lines, a blue one and an orange one, and the blue ones tells us with which probability the um, the network predicts the correct class in this case this is the primary visual cortex and what is the general maximum probability that the, that the model predicts in the best case this is the same which means that the model is correct on the left side we see the case when um, um, when we only operate in the coronal plane so the left left columns here so you see we just move to the regular uh, coronal cutting direction or we rotate within the coronal plane. So just no, no uh, benefit of 3D data here. And we see everything is green, which means that the model correctly identifies the area as HOC1. But if we move to the right, stuff gets more interesting. So we see, for example, in the middle, when we rotate outside of the coronal plane, so the elevation part, for example, here in the middle, we see that predictions are okay at the beginning, but then they start to become incorrect, which you see at the as, as the red um, uh, marked marked in red here. And then when we start to approach an image which is just flipped upside down, it becomes okay again. Let me try this. Yeah, so here it becomes okay again, and then it gets bad again. So you can obviously see that as soon as we leave the coronal plane, um, predictions get incorrect. And we can see something similar for um, for ele for elevation, roll, horizontal, and sagittal, and the effect is even more more severe when we are looking at the completely horizontal or the completely um, sagittal cross sections. The model is not even remotely correct, so it's not even close to HOC one. So why is this the case? If we look at what the what the cross sections look like here, we have an example on the left of the coronal plane, which is the natural cutting plane, and on the right we see the horizontal plane and we can already see from from far away that it looks a little bit different but if we zoom in it becomes very evident that even though the um, the sections are nicely reconstructed so the the matching of the cells as uh, jan oliver presented yesterday is already quite good it still does not look like a coronal section so we can't really um, it's not really a surprise that the neural network which is not used to images like the one on the right does not correctly predict the area so um, this is a this is a problem, and we thought about what can we do about this. And in this in this initial project, we thought about two approaches to tackle this problem. The first one is to simulate this. Let's call it uh, I call it here reconstruction artifact. So these stripes that we see during training to make the model robust against this kind of um, kind of artifact. And the other one is to correct the artifacts before prediction. So these two approaches. For the first one, we uh, took actually a very simple, simple approach um, where we said, okay, the artifacts are always visible as these, um, as these bars, which are which with a thickness equivalent to the six section thickness, so 20 micron. So we said, okay, let's try to simulate this. And with the, the simple approach here was to just take the set to, to subdivide the images into bars take the center line of each um, each of these bars and then just replicate it. And now you it would be great if you push, push the downward button again, because I can't do this with the remote here. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, what does this look like? Here on the left, we have original. On the right, right uh, on the right we have uh, one of these artificially generated images. And if we zoom in, we see that the white run almost look like one of these reconstructed images so it's very it's a very primitive approach i didn't expect much from it but um, when we artificially augment the images um, during training in 50 percent of the cases we get something like this so the left stays as before it was was okay before but now we don't we no longer have this extreme um, extreme misclassification effect that we saw before when we are rotating out of the plane Horizontal and sagittal are still not perfect, 
But what we see is in many cases, the predictions are correct. And even if the, correct, the predictions are not correct, so the red ones, we now have HOC2 or HOC6. So at least something visual. So the network is at least, let's call it less wrong when it does its prediction. So this is already nice. Um, the second approach that I said, which was um, uh, correcting the, um, the, these reconstruction artifacts before prediction, um, for this, we used um, what's called a style transfer. Probably many of you have seen images like this here on the right, where you can apply the style of a, of a painting, for example, to a photograph. Um, in Yiddish, we have a student, Cornelius Krein, actually a student supervised by, by Eric, um, who, uh, who works on style transfer to uh, D-Blur Z-Stacks. And for this project, I borrowed him and, um, uh, and uh, asked him to apply his method to, uh, to remove the reconstruction artifacts. Now I need another button down. I think it's the last one, I promise. <laughs> yeah, so here on the, on the left, we see the original image um, from, a, I think, a horizontal cross-section uh, before, before correction. On the right one, we see it after the correction. And if we zoom in, we see that it looks much more like an actual section. So you still can see some, some stripes if you look closely. Um, but it actually looks quite, uh, quite, um, quite impressive that, that the model is able to, um, to uh, transfer the style of a, of a coronal section to this horizontal cross, cross sections. And with this, with, this, with this experiment, I had the opposite effect of uh, what I showed before. So the first, with the first approach, I didn't expect much. And with this one, I expected, okay, now it works really well. But the result is that it's not working at all. <laughs> so um, now not even HOC1 is predicted correctly as we, see, as we see here. So now it thinks that this is HOC2 and this goes completely wild. So um, this not, did not re really work out, not to say that the general approach of correcting the artifact is bad, but in this, just with this method um, and also with some other uh, advanced um, iterations of this, it did, we couldn't really convince the network to, uh, to correctly predict the area. So our conclusion was this, that um, first the, the insight that we cannot just take the 3D reconstruction as they are at the moment and immediately use them for, um, for classification. Simulating the reconstruction artifacts is quite promising. And if we invest some more time into making this uh, more realistic, it might be even better. The style transfer produces visually convincing results, um, um, but the network has a different opinion on this. So um, one important result here in general is that if you're working with artificially generated or enhanced data, it does not need to look nice, but it also needs to uh, work well for the analysis workflow that you have in mind. So um, as this was an exploratory project, there's a lot of um, future work. Um, so one of them is, of, of course, do more, include more uh, 3D volumes um, um, into this analysis. and um, um, Jan Oliver and Marcel are actively working on this, so I'm expecting more volumes in the future um, because this results in an improved reconstruction workflow, so maybe even less, uh, less artifacts from the beginning. Um, it would be really interesting to include more brain areas, not just primary and secondary visual cortex, and also select particularly interesting uh, areas. So, for example, select something that is actually not classifiable in 2D at all, maybe because of the cutting angle, which can then potentially be fixed using the 3D data. Um, as the artifact simulation was quite, um, quite promising, it would be interesting to have a look at how, how we can make this, make this even better and maybe even use uh, something like style transfer to learn how to generate these artifacts artificially during training. And finally, some, some, uh, some, uh, some final potential work directions would be to, to improve the artifact correction. So um, the, um, uh, the removal of, uh, for example, the, the removal of missing sections with style transfer. Um, but I think the, 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 top, the top two would be, um, would be the most uh, promising ones. And with this, I'd like to close. Thank all my collaborators and I'm happy to take some questions if we have some time left. <laughs>